just gonna have texts that are, uh, you know, that are human. Okay, perfect.
I can still read it off, so I can still do that. I, I can, if you need to load something in, I can, I can, I can no, load it. No, 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 it's a, we, I won't, yeah, we won't mess with it. Um, we just, we have a land acknowledgement statement, so I can read it out just as well as having it on the screen. Yeah, not a concern. I've got to get a little clicker thing so you can just, oh, like, perfect. Yep. Very exactly. cool. Sweet. And a bill is very in a technology book. Yeah, right. <laughs> His favorite thing. Yes. <laughs> I'll give that to you, Bill. And I believe it is like this, and I think it's that button for me. I'll just hit that. It'll be easier yep, for me. Sure. Yeah, that's... Yep, that's all for you. I know you're very, you love technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of your 
students who was watching the door mm -hmm. was on an interview with us, and okay. I just can't recall if it was Anaya. Anaya. It yeah. was Anaya. Okay, Anaya. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, Z Zanaya is not here. I'm hoping that she shows no, up. No, I didn't so. see her. Okay, yeah, so cool. So. She was like, Hannah. I was like, oh. Yeah. I was like, I know you're one of the two. That's awesome. So thank yeah, that's, you. That's yeah. <laughs> She's such a good kid. Awesome. Super talented. Going places. So. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I think they're they're waiting for their mom, and so. Oh, excellent! And I think they found her. There we are. Perfect. Oh, baby. All right, I guess we'll go ahead and begin. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm Mr. Stegman. I teach science here at Kingsley. Uh, I just have a couple things I want to say, and then I'll kind of turn over to Mr. Kemp, and we'll talk and get this thing started. Uh, so welcome, students and community members. I want to start by thanking a few people that helped us set this event up. Thank you to Bill Kemp, Hannah Johnson, and Jeff Woodard for putting together the material for this event. The McLean County Mis History Museum of History is a local gem, and we, we are blessed to have access to the hard work that those at the museum give us. Thank you to Ryan Denham, at WGLT for their story for this event. Thank you to Ms. France, Mr. Larson, Mr. Popoki, Poposi. I got. I'm working on that one. Uh, Mr. Hill and the office staff, Ms. Eaton, Ms. Ambrose, and Ms. Maddox for helping get uh, tonight set up. Uh, thank you to the members of the Kings BS, Kingsley BSU for their hard work to help tonight's event happen. And thank you to everyone that showed up on this snowy Wednesday uh, day in February. Is it snow outside right now? No, 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 it was snowing. It was supposed to snow, so it was going to work when it was supposed to snow. <laughs> uh, the Kingsley BSU seeks to empower and celebrate black student identities by connecting with the community through service and providing a safe space to voice their experiences. One tenet of the statement is that we, ex we will explore tonight is the connection with our community. Black History Month often celebrates the lives of famous black leaders like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. While we should never underestimate their contributions to the American story, there are many others that have made an impact in the world in which we live. Tonight we celebrate those individuals who have made an impact on the community in which we live. With this, I'd like to introduce Bill Kemp of the McLean County Museum of History. That's right, we're gonna switch it up on you for just a minute. Um, we wanna take, for one thing, a moment to thank the Kingsley BSU and everyone here um, joining us this evening. But we would like to acknowledge that the land we call McLean County is the ancestral land of many native groups, beginning with the Paleo Indians 12,000 years ago, and most recently Algonquin speaking groups, including the Kickapoo, who were forced from this land in the 1830s. Other groups in this area include, but are not limited to, the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Odawa, Sauk, Kickapoo, Meskwaki, Lenape, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. These lands were and are the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal, and these lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. So now I will hand it off to Bill Kemp. Okay, thank you so much, Hannah. I trust everybody can hear me okay. Uh, this will be ha ha a talk, a 20, 25 minutes. Uh, it will uh, hinge significantly on images, so if, you, if you're having trouble seeing things, you wanna scoot up a little bit, because I think that will be part of the show. Okay, Eric, I can't get it to forward. Sorry. Yeah. What was it? There you go. Okay, thank you. So, um, I, I will say for too long, I think, um, this community, Bloomington Normal, has for, has for too long ignored its black history. The good, the bad, and unfortunately the ugly, right? One remarkable story not given its due uh, is that of Normal's black community 
in the late 19th century, beginning right after the Civil War and into the 20th century. It's really a remarkable story that was long forgotten and with the help of the Bloomington Normal Black History Project beginning in the 1980s, this community is beginning to look at that story again. The story of a remarkable black community in the town of Normal uh, beginning in the decades after the Civil War. Um, this photograph is probably the oldest known of the town of Normal. Uh, nothing in this uh, view survives today structure-wise. The largest building, that would be the Illinois State campus. At this time, it was known as the Normal University. That's what later is known as Old Main. That's the footprint of the flower beds on the quad today, right? And then the town of Normal is to the uh, right of the administration building or Old Main. This is probably taken at the top or the cupola of Jesse Fell's house looking toward campus. Fell played an instrumental role, Jesse Fell, right? The namesake of Fell Parks, both in Bloomington and Normal, uh, Fell Avenue, there's Fell Hall on the ISU campus, right? Um, he played an instrumental role in getting the Normal University campus located here and also founding the town of Normal. But for our purposes tonight, what's important about Fell is uh, he was a Quaker initially. He had a strong uh, anti-slavery inclination. He supported Abraham Lincoln and the anti-slavery movement in the 1850s, right? Um, and most remarkably, he attempted to create a, at least a modicum of, a, of, a, of, a, um, of racial harmony, harmony and equity in, this, in, the, in, in the town of Normal, a community that could be relatively integrated, at least from the perspective of somebody from the 19th century. Um, so what Fell did is he fostered uh, formerly enslaved individuals, men and women from the South, obviously, to come up to Normal after the Civil War and settle and make a life for themselves. And some of those formerly enslaved people, right, started families in Normal and even became homeowners. And that is relatively rare and unique in a lot of Northern communities. And it's a story we need to embrace more and more in this town. Uh, Simon Malone was an example of these formerly enslaved individuals that come to Normal and settle and raise a family after the Civil War. He was born into slavery in 1842. During the Civil War, he's 20 years old. He liberates himself and then fights for the Union Army. Two years after the Civil War, uh, he marries Julia Dillon and they settle in the town of Normal. And then they build a two-story framed house on the 500 block of Kingsley Street, right in front of us, or, or just down the street, right? Um, before the expansion of this school. Um, that house was lost to arson in uh, 1981. The following year, the Normal Human Relations Commission um, erected a temporary marker noting the construction of the, of the first home by an African-American in the town of Normal. But that sign, obviously, as you know, as you walk down Kingsley Street, is no longer there. We don't know what happened to it. No one from the town of Normal knows. But that would be an interesting project, right, for a student group to bring back a marker indicating the location of Simon Malone's house. I know there are people in the town of Normal waiting for the community to act on that. Um, We'll talk a little bit, or Jeff will, the next speaker on the Bloomington Normal Black History Project, but beginning in the 1980s, as I said, in the 1990s, they began to look at this remarkable black community in Normal in the 19th and the early 20th century. And they organized an archeological dig to look at the material culture of a working class, middle class family in the 19th and the 20th century. And they chose the Barton Family House, a well-known uh, African-American family from Normal at 304 East Cherry Street. The house is still there. Uh, and it was a project led by professional archaeologist Ed Jelks. Elk just, uh, Ed just passed away, right, a few months ago. This was a joint project as, of the Bloomington Normal Black History Project and uh, the McLean County Museum of History, where I work. This house stands red or reads Ed Jelk's report, quote, as a physical link to the relationship of the black community 
and their neighbors in normal during the 19th and 20th centuries. So one resource we have in, in the library archives and in our object collection, uh, but also within the papers of the Bloomington Normal Black History Project. Other sources we would have would be this book, uh, Black Families of Normal, and the author of that, the compiler, was longtime Normal resident Reginald Reggie Whitaker, who just passed away last June at the age of 96, born in Normal, graduate of Normal Community High School, spent most of his adult life in Normal, and wanted to uh, kind of compile the history of prominent black families in Normal. So this is an incredible resource. You're not gonna find cataloged in a lot of places, but we do have it uh, in our library. And in this case here, Reggie Whitaker in this book is looking at the uh, Walker and Duff families, born into slavery in 1865. Fanny Walker moved with her family to Normal, part of that migration to Normal in 1881. And in two, year, two years later in 1883, she marries Peter Duff, who once himself was also enslaved. And at that time, Duff was a carpenter and a handyman for Jesse Fell. And Jesse Fell was one of the few whites in all of McLean County that would sell property to black people. So Peter Duff buys a lot from Jesse Fell and they erect a home, which is really kind of another remarkable story within a story, right? Oops. And the, uh, the Duff home is at 107 West Poplar Street in Normal, and there is a, a, a historic marker on Constitution Trail noting the location of that house. Fanny and Peter had seven children, including Alberta, John Walker, and Julia, though all the Duff children finished high school locally, the schools were integrated really early and normal. Uh, local racist attitudes limited their employment opportunities locally, so they had to go elsewhere to work. That's one of the great tragedies of local history was the brain drain, right? We had integrated schools, blacks could be educated, uh, but then they had no really meaningful employment here, right? There were no black public school teachers in Bloomington Normal until what? The 1960s, right? So you had to go to St. Louis or Indianapolis or Tulsa or Chicago to find employment. This would be a much more richer uh, and interesting community if those folks stayed here and raised their own families, right? But that was not to happen. Okay, uh, I don't know if you know the story of the Fisk Jubilee Singers, right? Fisk College, today Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. After the Civil War is a, is a way to raise money for Fisk College, which is a historically black college, again in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, groups of Fisk students would travel the North and sing gospel or, 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 or black church music, right? Hymnals, right? Hymns. Uh, this was popularizing black spirituals or gospel music to white audiences in the North. So again, Fisk College, students traveling the North, uh, entertaining white audiences with black spirituals or gospel music uh, is a way to raise money for their historically black college. When the Fisk Jubilee Singers come to Bloomington in the 1880s and the 1890s, they're allowed to stay at the finest hotel in Bloomington, which at that time is the Ashley House at the corner of Center and Jefferson Street, just off the Courthouse Square. Of course they're welcome there. They're celebrities. They're artists. We want to show off the finest of our community to these welcomed visitors, right? That makes perfect sense. How do we know they stayed at the Ashley House? Well, we are a nationally accredited museum, and we have a wonderful archives, and we actually have the register of the Ashley House or Ashley Hotel from 1880 with the signatures of the Jubilee Singers because they were in town to perform. Is that not cool? They were back in 1881. But what happens? If the Fisk Jubilee Singers, which they will, come back in the 19-teens and the 1920s, right, 20 or 30 years later, or Duke Ellington, right, and his jazz band come in the 1930s, Duke Ellington, one of the greatest artists in world history, right? They cannot stay at the finest hotel in Bloomington, which at that time 
was the Illinois Hotel. It still stands today known as the Illinois House. So what happened, right? We're told that the arc of history bends towards social justice, right? Things always improve. And that's generally the case in American history, but we know we can take a step forward and sometimes a step or two back, right? And that's what happened from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, right? For blacks in this community, things took a turn for the worse. And that occurred throughout the North and of course in the Deep South. Woodrow Wilson is elected president in 1912. He's the first US president uh, since before the Civil War to be from the South. Although Woodrow Wilson is very progressive when it comes to certain issues like economics, when it comes to civil rights, he's very retrograde, right? He resegregates the federal workforce, right? Which had been integrated to some extent by his predecessors, right? Birth of a Nation, which is a notorious film which romanticizes the Ku Klux Klan, comes out in 1915 and is the most influential and popular American film until the talkies begin in the late 1920s, right? And it really, uh, for a lot of Americans, speaks to true history, even though we know it's a pack of lies, right? It romanticizes the Ku Klux Klan and its origin and its stereotypes in the most ugly ways African Americans, right? By the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan is resurgent throughout the United States and especially in the North. It's reborn as a white nationalist, law and order, anti-immigrant or anti-foreigner, and of course anti-black and also anti-Jewish organization that is very popular locally, right? There are large Klan parades and rallies in Bloomington Normal, sending a signal to the black community that things had changed, right? Folks are no longer welcomed as they once were. This story that I'm relating here is told very well in a 2017 article in the Journal of the Illinois State Historical Society by ISU professor Mark Wyman and District 87 Bloomington Public School educator Jack or John Muirhead. Jim Crow comes to central Illinois, racial segregation in 20th century Bloomington normal. It's a, it, it's a pretty short article. It's something junior high or middle school, middle school students could handle and it's a wonderful introduction to the story I'm telling here. Okay, so our, for our purposes here we must remember by the 19-teens, 1920s, right? If African Americans wanted to eat at a downtown restaurant in Bloomington or Uptown Normal, they had to knock on the back door and get the meal put in a paper sack to take home and eat. They were not welcomed anymore in restaurants. We know they couldn't stay at hotels. There was segregated seating in theaters, right? If blacks wanted to shop downtown at the department stores, they were welcome to do that, but unlike whites, they were not allowed to try on clothing, right? So these are issues of not only civil rights, but of, of, of human dignity as well, right? So this is our community and it's a story we can't forget. Uh, it's, it's, it's one we need to address and tackle and approach uh, and, and understand better and no longer forget, right? Um, in 1947, this is two years after the Civil War, Black and white veterans of World War II find out that there's a segregated restaurant right off campus on University Street, known as the Pilgrim Cafe or the Pilgrim Restaurant. In fact, most restaurants in Uptown Normal at this time are segregated, right? So they pick it, right? Uh, the ISU president is not happy about it. The ISU uh, student council is not happy about it. Uh, but finally, the owner capitulates and welcomes black uh, customers. So uh, you begin to see Jim Crow in Bloomington Normal being chipped away after World War II because black veterans, right, had fought for liberty and freedom overseas and then they come back to the United States and they're not allowed to eat at a restaurant attending school. The owner says, you could eat at the cafeteria at the school but you're not welcome here. Hence, they're going to pick it, right? Did it freeze up again? Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, real quickly, you know, we concentrate on public accommodations, right? Theater segregated seating, things of that nature, but even more pernicious, even uh, more harmful was uh, um, imp not uh, the restrictions on employment that African Americans faced for much of the 19th century into the 20th century, right? State Farm did not begin to hire blacks locally other than to serve as elevator operators or building service workers, uh, people to mop the floors, right, until the late 1950s, 1960s. The Chicago and Alton Railroad shops on the west side were the largest employer locally until the rise of State Farm. Uh, that was an engine for working class immigrants to become middle class citizens, to become homeowners, and ensure that their children can go to high school and then maybe even college. But the problem was all of those uh, unionized, skilled jobs were only available to whites. So, we, so American capitalism in the 19th century was a beautiful engine to take working class immigrants and send them into the middle class and give a better life to their children. But that was not open to black families right, in most communities, and it was not open to black families in Bloomington Normal. So we must remember that. We even had segregated American Legion posts. So after World War II, the American Legion is created and there are posts or units established in communities throughout the country, but throughout the North and elsewhere, uh, given the racial climate of, of the country, you have segregated American Legion posts, believe it or not. And that, that, that remains the case in locally into the 1960s. Uh, one of my uh, favorite local stories is Donald McHenry, who's still with us today. Uh, he graduated from Illinois State Normal University in 1957. He was from East St. Louis. Uh, he was raised by a single mother, right, single family household. Uh, he came to ISU and he became one of the best debaters, college debaters in all the nation. He helped organize a campus chapter of the NAACP. He led pickets of local businesses in Bloomington and Normal that did not allow black customers. Uh, he goes on to earn graduate degrees and during the Jimmy Carter administration becomes the ambassador to the United Nations, right? Really a remarkable figure, one we should embrace, an undergraduate at ISU, and there he is at the United Nations defending US policy during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the late 1970s, right? He still makes visits to Bloomington Normal to the ISU campus. He just donated $3 million a few years ago for an endowed chair or a program to bring uh, foreign uh, in, uh, policy scholars to campus. Um, and he would be a wonderful research project because he would respond to emails. He'd be happy to talk to students. So it's a relatively unknown local story, Donald McHenry. We had picketing, as I said, continue into the 1950s and 1960s. There's a normal barber shop in, uh, in late 1962. Another one of my favorite stories is Will Robinson and Doug Collins. Coach William J. Will Robinson became the, uh, an, uh, ISU, became the head coach at ISU for the ISU Redbirds in 1970. He's the first black head coach in NCAA Division I men's basketball. I don't know if anybody knew that here, right? But it's a great local story and it's another story we need to embrace. Will Robinson, first black coach for Division I college men's basketball, right? And he stays here five years and he recruits Doug Collins, right? A white kid from downstate, rural, an all-white community, went to an all-white high school. And Doug Collins, of course, becomes an all-American. He's the first person drafted in, in, in the NBA draft. He's a four-time All-Star. He becomes an NBA coach. Uh, but it's really a remarkable story, the friendship of these two people from very diverse backgrounds, right? Will Robinson was from Detroit, and he'll go back to Detroit after his five years at ISU. And many of you are probably familiar with the statue to Will Robinson and Doug Collins in front of Redbird Arena. 
Uh, real quickly as we wrap up here, we have a collection of papers related to the Booker T. Washington home. It was first known as the McLean County Home for Colored Children, right? That's right. Uh, the, 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 the race relations were such in the 20th century that this community thought it necessary to separate the most vulnerable of children, right, by race. So you had an orphanage, if you will, for black and mixed race children. You had an orphanage for white girls and then another orphanage for white boys. The McLean County Home for Colored Children, as I said, later becomes the Booker T. Washington Home. And we have a collection which includes not only newspaper clippings and photographs, but includes the register where children are being admitted to the colored home, right? Uh, at what date, what age they are, and all sorts of information. And here we see uh, the EBO children, EBO being admitted in 1939. So the most famous graduate of the McLean County Home for Colored Children, later the Booker T. Washington Home, would be Elizabeth Louise Betty Ebo, right? She was sent there. Uh, she becomes enamored with the Catholic faith. She will convert to Catholicism, and she will become a nun in the uh, Sisters of St. Mary in St. Louis. When she was six years old, she worked on a quilt for the Bloomington Normal Domestic Science Club, and we have that quilt in our collection. So not only do we have her being registered into the McLean County Home for Colored Children in our collections and archives, we also have a quilt which she worked on as a six-year-old girl while at the McLean County Home for Colored Children. Well, what happens to Betty Ebo? She becomes Sister Mary Antona Ebo uh, from St. Louis, and she becomes one of the sisters of Selma. In 1965, she's marching with Dr. King for voting rights in the Deep South, right? And what does she say? She says to the press when she's in Selma in 1965, I, I am here because I'm a Negro, a nun, a Catholic, and because I want to bear witness. So again, just an incredible story with a lot of local connections that I think would appeal to young people. Uh, many of you know that in 2018, in September, the Illinois State Historical Society in partnership with the museum where I work, the local chapter, the NAACP, and other groups dedicated a historic marker to the fact that this community had segregated beaches, a beach for black people and a beach for white people from 1908 into the 1950s at Miller Park, right? The only public beaches available to the local residents were segregated by the color of your skin from 1908 to, 19, to the early 1950s. And there's the location. If you know where the, where the beach part of the Miller Park Lake is located, that's where the white beach was. The lagoon was where the black beach was, and there was hardly a beach to speak of. So not only was it separate, but it was grotesquely unequal facilities, right? In 1950, the local chapter, the NAACP, writes to help the department to say, the conditions at the Black Beach are utterly abysmal. The toilets aren't even connected to the sewer system. They're basically just open outhouses, right? Uh, and this basically shames the city into finally closing the segregated Black Beach. But it doesn't happen until after World War II. So in 2018, we dedicated the marker to the fact that we had segregated beaches. And Dr. Mark Wyman played an instrumental role in seeing to the erection of this marker. And we did get some criticism from people, right? Why are you talking about something like this? This is a, this is a stain on our history. It's not something we want to tell the world about. But Dr. Wyman said, a great nation does not hide its history. It faces its flaws and it corrects them. By dedicating this marker, we're helping to uncover a community secret. And that secret is this, Bloomington Normal were held in the grip of racial segregation for the first half of the 20th century and beyond. So you need to shine a light on something if you're going to heal and move forward. And that was kind of the spirit of this marker. So if you're ever at Miller Park, please take time to take a, a, a visit. And the last story I'll wrap up with is Merlin Kennedy, 
uh, the Black Santa. Merlin Kennedy was more than the Black Santa, right? He played a, a, an important role in, in leading the local chapter of the NAACP in the 1950s and 1960s. He helped establish the Bloomington Human Relations Commission. He was active in, 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 in black employment issues. Uh, but in 1965, one year before this photo, the NAACP has kind of a controversial float. And Merlin Kennedy, who's kind of a rabble rouser, dresses up as Santa Claus, right? That float is not permitted to continue, and uh, Merlin Kennedy is not, uh, is not uh, permitted to continue as Black Santa, because Mayor Bob McGraw says there's a one Santa rule, and you cannot have controversial floats for the Santa parade. So the following year, in 1966, the NAACP comes back with another controversial float, and Merlin Kennedy returns as a black Santa, right? Uh, the, the float is again stopped by the Bloomington police. Merlin Kennedy is told to step down from the float, but he continues to walk along the parade route, but along the sidewalk. The police stop him, and an ISU English professor who was a member of the NAACP shouts, they're arresting Santa Claus. And everybody looks at Merlin Kennedy and the police, and what are the police gonna do? You can't arrest Santa. So they allow Merlin Kennedy to continue marching along, and the story gets picked up in the national press, including Jet Magazine, a Black Digest, which was really popular for much of the 20th century. Oops. Um, and it gets picked up in the Decatur newspaper and elsewhere. So the legend of the Black Santa really uh, uh, dates to that time. Uh, Merlin Kennedy, who passed away a year or so ago, back in 2015, I don't know why it's doing that, back in 2015, he dressed up once more as Santa at the Uptown Station uh, Santa Shack and welcome children once again, because it was, it was a really nice healing mo moment for the community. And we do have Merlin Kennedy Santa suit on display in our Community and Conflict exhibit at our museum. And now I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Jeff. Thanks again for having me. Can you hear me okay? Thanks, Bill. I think this is the first time I've ever had to follow our librarian at the museum, so <laughs> bear with me here. <laughs> bear with me. Um, yeah, Merlin Kennedy was something else. He was a great person. He liked softball, too. He organized a lot of teams that played ball around, around town. Um, so I understand we came to talk about leaders, and I see a lot of leaders in the room, so I'm, I'm, really, I'm really excited about that. Because you didn't have to come, or did you? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so this is Black History Month, right? And we celebrate black history, and which, which I think is a beautiful thing. But uh, I came to talk to you today about the uh, Bloomington Normal Black History Project. And we celebrate black history 365 days a year, right? So I'm here to talk to you today about the stories you just heard and how do we know what we know, right? We talk about primary resources. Um, you're doing a lot of studies right now at, at this age. Anybody hear of the um, Harlem Renaissance? Raise your hand. Yeah. That's one of my favorite periods. And the reason why. I bring up the Harlem Renaissance is because all these enriched stories that you get to hear, you have to think about how did they know these things, right? Somebody had to share these stories and hand them down. Um, the Bloomington Normal Black History Project has its roots that date back several decades, as far back as the 1930s, as far as we could tell. And I'm going to see if I get the clicker to work here. Could help me out here. I can't see. Uh, it's just going to be this, and you can hit the button that way if you want to be fancy. I'd be that. fancy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Course, cool. So. Yeah. So how do we know what we know, right? Um, you hear stories from your parents and your great grandparents and and such, and uh, there's family reunions. Anybody uh, attend family reunions? Yeah. Do you like going to family reunions? They're very important. 
They really are, because that's where you get to really find out where you come from. So with that, how do you know what we know? I talked about primary resources. I'll just give you an overview of the uh, Black History Project. And uh, Wyatt Wells, there he is. Uh, I don't have an image of him to show to you today, but Wyatt Wells was commissioned by the WPA, Works Progress Administration, uh, during Roosevelt's era. And basically, they uh, gave uh, jobs. It was an ambitious employment and infrastructure program created by the president in about 1935. And um, there was some mural projects, and um, there was uh, beautiful new uh, libraries built and that, but at that time, um, Wyatt Wells, just out of high school, only a couple years older than you folks, uh, he wrote a history of blacks, African Americans in, in McLean County. And then uh, sometime later, in the 1950s, uh, activist Carolville Washington, she participated in the same project and um, she wrote a couple of essays on uh, African American churches and their choirs. And uh, bear with me here, I'm gonna be throwing out a lot of dates and some names and stuff, but um, uh, don't worry about that. Just think about a couple of names I'm gonna share with you because these are the, really the true leaders of McLean County. And these are gonna be the same people that I see a lot of you in the audience will be doing the same thing. So uh, she wrote about the uh, choirs and uh, there she is the late Carabelle Washington. And um, in 1970, a Marge Smith organized a group of African Americans to discuss their history. And from that effort, the group managed to collect a considerable amount of objects and information on the black community. So now we're starting to get information and we're starting to get stories. In the early 80s, a collaboration emerged and Dr. Pratt began sending her students from the ISU Social Work School into the community to interview uh, several elder members of the community, right? They talked about med medical practices, but they were really looking at, uh, interested in uh, home remedies, which I found very fascinating. And they started getting all these really rich stories. So they thought that this really should continue. So over time, the group expanded and collaborating with the McLean County Museum of History and uh, Illinois Humanities Council grant that was uh, helped uh, to be secured by uh, Greg Coos, who was then our executive director. That was a very important start for us because it led to a 55 page narrative. We the people tell our story, our own story in 1986. So interest grew in the project and the collecting efforts to secure more and more projects, more and more objects for the project and a small exhibit followed in 1988. In 1989, the Bloomington Normal Black History Project began a formal relationship with the McLean County Museum of History and we now serve as a repository for all the accumulated materials that are now in the museum's permanent collection, some of which you've seen uh, shown by uh, Mr. Kemp today. By 1990, uh, Mildred Pratt and Dr. Shaw had conducted 65 oral history interviews, and all of these interviews can be seen at our website, mchistory.org. You go to resources, it's all there. We got uh, the Black History Project there and uh, also an additional uh, additional link to uh, all the black resources or African-American uh, resources at the museum. So it's right at your fingertips, right? Um, so that was uh, 65 had been uh, transcribed at that time. I think we're up to about 82. And there are some stories that we've been collecting here recently that just need to be transcribed. So um, remember those words, right? Opportunity for you to write, for you to record, for you to transcribe, and then those materials can be added to our collection. And that's what we need. We need other young people to do that for us. So over the years, project members, students, 
like yourself, scholars and volunteers, we need our volunteers, uh, contribute to collect, record, and transcribe interviews and uh, archaeological digs, artifacts, photographs, as uh, Bill mentioned, uh, portraits, church and club histories and memorabilia, and research articles documenting the black experience in McLean County. Of course, these materials uh, form the basis of an exhibit, Presence, Pride, and Passion, A History of African Americans in McLean County, which opened in 2006, about a year after I started at the museum. So that was really exciting for me to just come into the museum and, and, and get to be just immersed and surrounded by all of this rich history. It was important, and then get to work with all these wonderful historians and educators, and I, I find myself to be very um, lucky in that regard. So I won't keep you because I know Hannah's got some really exciting and some more fun stuff, I think, ahead of you. But um, I did want to share with you while I'm here that um, there was also an accompanying uh, book of the same title. And you can see it here, Presence, Pride, and Passion, History of um, African Americans. And I believe you have copies of that in your library. And you can also access it at our website online. And uh, that will get you a really good start on the basics of African Americans in McLean County beginning in the um, 1930s. Um, but before I go, I wanted to share something with you. Why, why do we do this, right? Why do we do that? Because it makes us a better place. And it helps us to understand each other. I'll share a story with you. I came here in uh, 1989, didn't know anyone here. I came to work for McLean County uh, uh, Mitsubishi's uh, uh, motor plant, which is now Rivian. And um, I remember coming here and, and didn't know anybody. I went to the store and um, I was looking at a newspaper that was sitting on the counter and uh, an elderly white woman was there ahead of me checking out. And she looked at me and she says, um, what are you looking at? And I said, excuse me? She said, yeah, what are you looking at? She says, that's my paper. They sell them over there. And I just, I just feel really out of place. And we would go out in our uniforms and people would ask us, hey, how did you get a job here? You know, my, my grandfather or my uncle applied for this job and they didn't get it. Well, you know, they hired the people that I guess they were qualified. But the reason why I'm sharing this story with you is that I really fell out of place here and I went home every weekend for a year, entire year. I didn't know anybody, didn't visit anybody, didn't go anywhere or any of that. And um, thus I was introduced to the Black History Project. And I started learning about the lives and the accomplishments and the stories and all these different characters and these people. And, and, and in regards to feeling like you didn't belong, that was the furthest thing from the truth. And I realized that all of the people that I stood on on their shoulders, right? Made me the person that I am today. So when you talk about history, it's just not about history teachers. Because we have them, they're great, right? They share all these things with you, but there's so many other things that you can learn from learning about yourself. So in closing, I'm hoping to groom another generation of leaders like yourself to continue this project, right? so we can continue to collect, interpret, and preserve the voices just like the one I shared with you today. Okay? Thank you. All right, so I know that we are nearing almost an hour and you've been such an amazing, attentive audience, right? Um, but we do want to kind of take it full circle, right? We talked about the history. We talked about the folks who are involved in preserving and capturing and recording that history. But then what comes next, right? It's not just about having those records behind closed doors in the museum, which is great, right? But how do we make those things and those stories accessible? How do we have fun with it, right? So first, I just wanna know who has visited the History Museum before? Has anyone in the room? Okay, excellent. 
So if you haven't, we would love to see you there. But we want to talk about now, right, what is inspired about what we know. Um, so these are two examples of a recent collaboration in 2021 with Jack and Jill of America, Inc. Jack and Jill of America has a local chapter. Um, the chapter is dedicated to educating um, Black and African American young people in our community. And so first for Black History Month, last February, we partnered um, with the museum, the Bloomington Normal Black History Project, Jack and Jill of America, to create a Black History Bingo program. Um, at that point, we were still only connecting um, via screens, and so this was a Zoom program. But we were able, right, what's so great about Zoom is that you can connect with people um, that you may not be able to otherwise, and so we were all be able um, to share space and learn about some of the stories that Bill walked us through. Um, and that collaboration continued into May. And Jack and Jill of America has a National Day of Fitness. And if you don't know, May is also Preservation Month. So that's something that's very close to our hearts at the History Museum, right? Historic preservation, thinking about the architecture that surrounds us. And what we were able to do is we were um, able to create walking maps of local black history sites in Bloomington and in Normal. Um, thinking both about the architecture, right, the, the beautiful buildings around us or um, the spaces that may no longer exist, right, but still remembering who would have inhabited those spaces and really bringing the focus to the people um, who, who lived in those spaces, worked in those spaces. And so these are resources that are available um, and we hope to bring them back again for this preservation month. Um, another thing that we do is we do a lot of Girl Scout programming, okay? So this is an example of our Playing the Past um, program that we do with older Girl Scouts. And I bring this up, right, because this is an opportunity to share these stories with girls of all different backgrounds um, and experiences. And so we talk about Luana Sanders Clark. Um, Bill mentioned, right, that um, black students at ISU, they couldn't live, they couldn't dine on campus. So there was a moment in time, and a pretty long moment in time, where uh, students were reliant upon the generosity of people in their community to open up their homes so that they could go to school, right, get that education, but at a place that didn't welcome them at the dining table, didn't allow them to live on campus. We can share the story of Sister Ebo, right? And her march in Selma and the activism that she participated in. And Eva Jones, who was our first um, person of color, not only woman of color, um, to serve on Bloomington City Council. All right, another way that we've interpreted the material, right, that we know because of the Bloomington Normal Black History Project is through a mock excavation. So every summer we host a camp for late elementary schoolers, so entering um, fourth, fifth, and sixth grades. And um, we do an archeology span day. And so that excavation word, right? We're digging in the dirt, um, uncovering artifacts, objects that were used by people, made by people. And this last summer, we took the opportunity. We were talking all day about food ways, right? And what was so great about the collection that was um, excavated from the Barton home was we, there were canning jars, there were animal bones, there were cooking utensils. So we got this really great picture of not only how these people lived, but also how they ate. And so we explored that with our summer campers this past summer with a mock excavation at the David Davis Mansion. Who's been to the David Davis Mansion? Another one of my favorites, excellent. We are also not the only ones who get to explore this material and make something new with it. So Alan Moore, um, who is a sound artist and musician, um, he had a artist in residency through Point Forward, which is a local organization that was created in 2018. And they bring musicians together from all over central Illinois who are doing, they're kind of pushing the boundaries, right, of what is music, what is sound art. And so Alan, who um, kind of self-describes um, his interest in nurturing and capturing the black imagination, was really drawn to the materials that we had in the Bloomington Normal Black History Project. And what he did is he took oral histories, right, that's recorded interviews with folks, and he made sound art, he made music with them. 
and um, he was able to come on site. He was able to explore that collection, think about the sounds, right, that were just speech, but that he could um, create and layer um, and pair with music. And then he was able to present that music in our physical space. Um, and so working with the collections, working with this history, but in this really kind of present and contemporary way. And then what I did, inspired by the work that Alan Moore did, right, was introduce that music to a different set of summer campers um, this summer. And so we thought about music, we thought about local black history, we made our own um, uh, instruments, right? And so it's thinking about all of these little nuggets that can prove inspiring in some way. And it doesn't always mean reading that history textbook, right? Or um, yeah, looking at a map or a picture or even a visit to the museum. It's how does this history continue to inspire us in different and creative ways? All right, so another example is our Breaking Bread in McLean County program. This was something that we presented last year. We had a very busy year in 2021. Um, but this was a 10-part program series that we um, offered online. So you can go and you can watch these programs. And this program specifically was to look at different migrant and immigrant groups and their stories here locally and how those stories compare, contrast, right? What are some of those lived experiences that are the same and different? So two of the ones that I pulled out here um, were with Willie Holton Halpert and her granddaughter Brooklyn, as well as Aurora and Lillian Kiamana. And so Willie and her granddaughter um, cooked soul food as part of our um, soul, green, and savory things um, presentation. And Aurora and Lillian um, cooked makate um, as part of our um, Sava uh, cassava program. So looking at Congolese Americans and their lived experience here in McLean County um, and uh, local Black and African Americans. Um, and so again, just an idea of how multi-generational families, right, can continue to contribute to these stories and these stories are still being made today. So like history doesn't stop last year or last week, right? Every moment um, is, is new history for us. And so to bring it back to the museum and to bring it back to our physical space, um, Bill mentioned talking about Merlin Kennedy, right? And his Black Santa Claus story that is featured in our community and conflict exhibit at the museum. What's really great about our exhibits is that they're also available online. So you can learn more about Merlin Kennedy, you can learn more about other um, stories of historic note um, that are presented at the museum. But if our audio works, I really want us to be able to listen to um, the words of Merlin Kennedy in his own voice talking about his experience um, that day. So let's. Here is Merlin Kennedy in a 2010 oral history if they can come up with a reason to take me to jail legally, they probably would have. But they couldn't come up with a reason. And, and not only the minority was crowded around the police, the Gulf Island policemen, there was some uh, Caucasian people crowded around the policemen. They got scared and they backed out. Because the kids, they didn't care. They just saw a red suit, you know, Santa Claus. Who, who, who is Santa Claus? Mommy, that's Santa Claus. That ain't Santa Claus. Come on here. You know, she jerked me off, jerked the boy, and the boy in her heart. Trying to get him away from me. Because she didn't want him to realize the, the Santa Claus was just a suit, you know, regardless of who was in it. Okay, so again, an example of how some of these projects are decades in the making, right? You might capture a story 20 years ago and you have that recording or you have that transcription and then we only just opened this exhibit in 2019. So it took us that long, but we now have a space where people can hear um, the words of these folks as they said them in real time. Here is Merlin Kennedy in a 2010 oral history interview. Sorry about that. All right. So then, to um, wrap up real quickly, uh, back referencing what uh, Jeff has already mentioned to you, right? 
So much of this content is available online for you to continue to explore, and we do have a specific document um, that brings together all of our resources pertaining to Black and African American history here locally, um, and that can be reached at MCMH Black History, um, and that includes not only the Black History Project, right, but all of the other um, programmatics and resources um, that are relevant to that subject matter. Okay, so then to end, um, we're going to play two really quick audio clips for you um, so that we can end this evening together um, with the words of Carabelle Washington and Dr. Mildred Pratt, who again were founders, mothers of what we know today as the Bloomington Normal Black History Project. So we're going to start with words from um, Dr. Mildred Pratt. And these were recorded in 2008 at the closing ceremony um, of the Presence Pride and Passion exhibit. So this is Dr. Pratt. Uh, what I'd like to say is that I think this project is unusual in many respects. Um, one, it's not a project that is focused on the history of Black people. Right? It's a project that is So to reiterate, right, it's not about being professional. It's not about having certain degrees or even um, expertise, right? It's just having that interest and in being able to work together towards a common goal. And then we're going to end, and especially when we're thinking about leadership, right, and we're thinking about what's coming next, right? What's, what's the next opportunity? Um, let's hear what Carabelle Washington has to say about that. that if they do not know what is happening behind them, they might not make the most progress on the road ahead of them. It is so important. I know we say, oh, that's old-fashioned. There's nothing old-fashioned. It's historical. But that's long since the past. Yes, it is the past. But it is history. And we would not have known what we know today if there had not been somebody back there saying, I must jack this down. I must make a new time. So someone in my bed of me will know that we, we were here, that we had struggles, that we had successes, that we had failures, but it's still all about this story. I said to somebody not too long ago, I, I've been a lot of places, and I have met many, many people. Some of them ordinary, some of them famous, some in between, some struggling, some already made success. But I'm sure that if you think about it, you will remember there were some people 
who inflicted oppression on their lives. And you must pass it on. You must remember you are a part of history. You are living it. And it will not stay alive if you are not documenting it for those who will come behind you. Now I'm not going to All right, thank you everyone. All right, so we were gonna kind of turn over some questions for the McClinkai Museum. Uh, they kind of have a panel here. Uh, I'll come around if you have a question. I just raise your hand and I will bring my phone to you and we'll turn over to our panel. We're always looking for volunteers um, in all of our departments, but in terms of the Black History Project, uh, we're looking to engage students where we can possibly train uh, students. And it's not really that hard to actually do oral histories. You can start by doing maybe one of your family members. We can show you how to do that. And maybe we can progress off into uh, doing some more um, oral histories. Uh, some of our uh, older people in the community that are getting older, and we need to get those stories from them. Um, some of them we have stories on already, but um, we need to have more in-depth stories. And I think this would be a good opportunity, a generational thing for um, young people to um, sit down with the elder people, because you can really learn so much. I know I have. I, I enjoy doing it. I really do. It's fascinating. That's just one thing you can do. But you can uh, um, assist with uh, events that we may have, um, the Jew team, things of that nature. We've also had a reboot of the Black History Project in 2018. We had um, uh, Willie Howard Gordon uh, put together uh, some young students, you may know some of them, that did uh, a series, what they call living statues, where they portrayed actual uh, people uh, uh, from the uh, citizens of uh, McLean County, uh, like uh, Mr. Gasson, uh, Lucinda the Posey, she mentioned, and others. Uh, so there's always an opportunity for theater, music, poetry, writing, uh, recording, uh, video. I know kids are in the video now. You can call your kids or young people. I'm sorry. But uh, that's just a few things. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other questions? the event that you have coming for the Black History Project? I believe what's slated to come up next is probably be the uh, Juneteenth because uh, we were looking to do something um, with a, uh, uh, a collecting or sharing exercise and it didn't come off because of uh, this whole new variant and such. But uh, for sure, I know there will be a Juneteenth festival. Thank you. I'm going to stay here all night until I hear from one of my young people. <laughs> You're going to have to feed me, too, because I'm hungry. <laughs> you in the red jacket, you got a question. I know you got a question. <laughs> no? Okay. I got a question um, while we're waiting for them to come up with the question, because I'm, I'm going to get one. But you, I, I heard the uh, WGLT. Um, news interviews and there were some young leaders on there. Are any of those here tonight? Um, back there? Yeah. Nice job. Thank you for doing that. So you have a question too, right? Yeah, you got a question. <laughs> Thank you. 
about opportunities like this is that every presentation that we do is new because it's framed in a different way, right? And knowing the audience that we're talking to, knowing the intent behind it or the purpose, that helps us kind of revision and reframe what we're talking about. And we learn something new, even just talking to each other all the time. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of years of, of learning and repeating, right? Like I'm a person who, um, I like to read things lots of times <laughs> before you know, they really sink in. Um, but when you live it, right? And you recognize that history around you and you start picking up little tidbits, even like Bill's tidbit about ISU campus and how where the flowers are it used to be Old Main. I never really realized that. Um, but now, every time I walk by those flowers, I'm gonna picture this big building that I've seen pictures of, but I've never seen in person. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're able to, to pull this information together um, in ways that, you know, is, is pretty quick, um, but at the same time, it's just about, you know, remaining aware of, of the information that you have and, and the stuff that you're living every day. Yeah, and it's about collecting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, constantly continue to collect resources. Right? Our other GLT person just walked in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my, my question was, um, at the beginning of the slides, you kind of talked about how there was like a sign outside of the like normal like community. I'm not sure exactly what it was called, but will we ever have like a project where we like rebuild it or some like work on it somehow? So that, that was a question about the Simon Malone marker that the normal uh, Human Relations Commission erected, but then the sign didn't last that long because the, uh, it just wasn't built for Midwest weather. So that there's, there's an opportunity there for students to work with the Town of Normal in working to get a new marker placed there. I know that the Town of Normal has a marker program to some extent, and you can work with other not-for-profits like the museum. So there's just an opportunity there given its proximity to the school as well. It's a really unique story. It sounds to me like a really good project for the BSU or possibly you know, the Kingsley BSU or the Evans BSU or just the BSUs for Unit 5 uh, or maybe District 8, District 8 as well too. So. Cool. Good. so to add to that, right, and to speak to how kind of powerful um, student ideas and efforts can be, right? So really close to us in El Paso, Illinois, is um, the future site of the Project 15 Museum. And so this is a museum that's opening um, to commemorate the story of David Struthers, who is the first black man to vote in Illinois. Um, and they want it also to be one of the nation's first voting rights museums. So not only um, commemorating the story of David Struther and his historic moment, but also looking at voting rights um, um, across demographics, right, in, in the United States. But the idea for that museum started in a history classroom. And so students did the research, they discovered a story that really resonated with them and they wanted to share with other people, and they happened to present that idea to the people who owned the building, right, the historic site, and they loved the idea too. And now all of a sudden, because of this high school class project, right, 
we in central Illinois are gaining another museum that will bring people hopefully from all over the country to come and learn the story of David Strether, voting rights in the United States, and you know, bring them to our Midwestern communities. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's always potential, right? So if you have an idea, be willing to share it because you, know, you never know what the result might be. Our other WGL personality is here now too, and she has a question for us. <laughs> I'm going to pass it over to Bill, but I'll say that um, we like pride ourselves in being a premier institution that has a wealth of information on um, black history in this region, and um, we're really proud of that, and we're, we're happy to see uh, young people come out and use those resources. But Bill, maybe you can speak to what uh, universities will have. Yeah. Do you have anything? Yeah, obviously the two universities will have black student groups. We're actually working with a few groups at ISU on a new historic marker related to the picketing of the Pilgrim Restaurant in 1947. So, um, but as far as pro programs on local black history, I think the museum is the one place where you're going to get that. And we do various types of programs like this, so we get much more in depth in the local black story than you even heard today. And, uh, yes. So yeah, and I'd say um, my recommendation would, you know, again to second what Bill was saying, was really look at the universities and um, like even, I think it was last night, um, through ISU there's an ongoing um, online program about um, comic books, okay, but they specifically last night were featuring um, stories about the creators of Black Panther, and um, so, and I would also say, um, look to local musicians, look to local art galleries, right? So often, exhibits will be dedicated um, to, um, to black artists and musicians, and so if you kind of pick out those different places, um, and just check back in, right? Um, and what, you know, hopefully, is that not all of these programs, right, are relegated to the month of February, that throughout the community, there's more and more opportunity um, to engage with these works of art and with these stories um, throughout the year. But definitely, um, a lot of university programs, ISU Wesleyan, are open to the public. And that's what we don't always remember, is that you don't have to be a student there to go to the programs that they're offering. And these are places with, you know, hundreds of folks doing different kinds of research and um, presenting that um, in a lot of different ways. So. I would say Riverfront is now too in Peoria. Mm -hmm. I would say Riverfront. Uh, Riverfront in Peoria. Yeah, so in Peoria would be uh, definitely something to keep an eye on. Anybody else? Too. Anybody else? Last chance. Last chance. All right, I'm going to wrap the applause for Matthew Stone. Thank you so much. Well, we want to close up by thanking everybody for coming out tonight. We're hoping that this can be something we do more often. Yeah. Uh, and also, we're hoping to get some promotion for the Think Time Museum. Because it's a great place to learn about uh, your community uh, and learn about black history. So, thank you guys for coming out tonight.